up and running. Good morning, good morning. We've just missed a little I know, sunshine episode here. <clears throat> if I go back just about two minutes or three minutes, this is what we had. We had the sun shining on the Don Quixote window. It was actually coming right in the camera. Cold for everybody today. You know, it's not too bad in Tokyo this morning. It's chilly, not dramatically cold. I think we'll have a sunny day. <clears throat> Over the weekend, we had quite a bit of mixed stuff. We had the sleet, wind and rain and sleet uh, Saturday night. And Sunday was cold and clear but windy. And now it's chilly but clear. Monday morning be a peaceful day here in Asakusa for the most part. We're in the off season now. There's not so many parties. Restaurants have empty seats. There's still crowds over the temple. There's lots of tourists in town. January for us, it's the 15th today, so I've got my bookkeeping halfway done. I looked at some numbers last night, and we are 80% of last year's full January, and it's only the 15th. <laughs> in that last video, I said, that's it, we're done, and we won't be growing anymore. And yet here we are, this January is way, way more people than last January. I don't know, I don't know what to do. Anyway, good morning, good morning. What we're doing today, it's going to be a real mixed stream today. Really, really mixed. <laughs> what I did, Tom, I went back to, uh, we've got the hangings, you know, she keeps bringing us a new wall hanging every now and then. It's not a regular thing, every half a year or so, or sometimes every year. The landlady visits and with her friend, and as a gesture, they bring us a new little a wall hanging slash tapestry. They're all made from old kimono. The, the, her friend collects old kimono fabrics and uh, she chops them up for this kind of stuff. So I didn't have a, a new one. So what I did was when I remembered Tom's uh, comment here, I went back to the little file upstairs and I pulled out the oldest one. So this must be the first one she brought for us back in 2017 or so. We also, too, because it's January, it's a three-year, three-year lease, we just signed on again for three more years in this place. So those of you who are wondering about that, uh, with three more years right here. It's a three-year rollover. What, what do you call it in English? It's a rollover lease. I know we automatically get to stay. We don't have to renegotiate everything. We don't have to start from zero. We don't have to pay the, the gift money at the beginning and every time. It's a rollover. We do have to pay what's called koshindyo, renewal fee, and that amounts to 1.5 months rent. And that goes in the pocket of the dude who, <coughs> there's a dude here, he's the go-between, he's a real estate agent. We never do paperwork directly with a, a, a landholder or, or a building owner. There's always a real estate agent in between. The deal being that they know the legal ins and outs and people like us and people like the landlady who wants a building, we don't know the details. So the guy in the middle sits there and of course he pockets his fees. He must be taking a percentage from her every month. I don't know what that is, 5% maybe, I don't know. But he also gets the renewal fee, which is 1.5 months rent. And I can't actually, I can't tell you how much that is. Because in our lease, we've mentioned this before, in our lease there is a clause that specifically states we will not publicly disclose the amount of our lease, the amount of our rent. And I can guess why. I can guess why. She doesn't own the land. All the land around here is owned by the temple. Senzoji Temple, the place you go and you throw your five million coins. They own all the land in this area. Uh, from the river to Kokusai Dori, the main street on our west, and from the north, from it's about Kotodori Dori to the south, I guess about where Kaminari Mon is, I don't know exactly. They own all, all the land in this uh, whole district. So, so people are just uh, leaseholders. So the lady who owns this building is a leaseholder on the land, and she owns the physical structure, which is worth, at the moment, zero, because it's so old and in such bad condition. The value for her is not in the structure, the value is in the lease, which she has. And if we wanted to buy it from her, 
we were thinking about that some years ago. If we wanted to buy it from her, we would have to negotiate with her, pay her the money for the building, which is usable, of course. I said it's legally depreciated to zero, but it's, it has a useful value. But then we would have to pay Senzoji Temple the fee to transfer the lease from her to us. And I understand, I'm, don't quote me on this, I understand that would be about Gohyaku Mam. Five, about $50,000, about 5 million yen. But I don't know, that's just what I've heard. Who was I talking to? I don't know. So uh, around here, everything. Probably all the land from here to Ueno Park. There's a million temples there. It's pretty much all owned by the temples. This group is owned by Sensoji. The next group to the west towards Ueno will be owned by Higashi Honganji. They, they just owned this entire district back in the old days, and, and they still do. Okay, what are we going to do today? We're, it's, I said, it's going to be a mix, it's going to be a mix. And uh, the first step is I have to finish. I didn't finish the other day. We have to finish off the link block. The link block. If somebody didn't know what it meant, what would that mean? I started it, I got you, I did it on the stream, but I haven't finished it off. So that'll, that'll take the first half of our stream today. And for the last half of the stream, we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll see what it is when we get there. Should we buy the building or should we attempt to buy the building? It's an open question. When we came here 10 years ago, land values in this area were low. The pandemic hit harder and the land values became even more depressed. That would have perhaps been a good time to talk about that, but we were in the middle of a pandemic. We had no resources like that. Now that it's post-pandemic, Asakusa is one of the top areas in this country of increase in land values. The land values are skyrocketing because people, there's no way we could afford to buy this now. As to whether it would be a good idea or not, that's an open question. You tell me, what's the timetable on sea level rise? Because this floor here, where I'm sitting right now, is, give or take a few centimeters, this is sea level. This is zero. We're not below sea level, but we're not much above it either. The area here where the Richmond Hotel is, just behind where the camera is looking, was a pond. It was Hyotan Ike. This street and this little neighborhood here is the bottom of the bowl of the land that is Asakusa. And we are at sea level. So should I buy this building? How long is it going to take for Greenland and Antarctica to do their thing? Anyway, it's a moot point. I'm not about to do that. She's not about to sell it, I think. And I'm not about to go into debt for the rest of my life at 72 years old to benefit who? I could imagine the scene. You know, we decide to buy it. We arrange financing. We get a mortgage, you know, whatever it is. 15, 20 years or something, whatever. We pay it, pay it, pay it. I'm in debt. We pay it off. We struggle. We pay it off. We pay it off. I'm 72, I get to be 82, 87, 80, 92, and the last month of the mortgage comes, it's mine, all mine, 92 years old, yeah, right. <laughs> Not going to happen. I've, I've done my last mortgage for sure, absolutely. <laughs> We're going to be right there. So we want to zoom somewhere about there. But it's a question, you know, business like ours, if we could own our building, it would be such a secure thing for the future. The other print companies, people like Watanabe down in the Ginza, Adachi over where they are in Mejiro, you know, they own their own buildings. So they're so much more secure. What Nabe, the print company in Ginza, when you look at them, I don't know their numbers, but they're probably basically a real estate company. They've got the land, and at some point they, they had a new building put on it, which is like 10 stories high. So they've got the shop at the bottom, offices on the second floor, something on the third floor, then the rest is all rent. So if you've got your own building, man, you can just go through the good years and bad years.
how important is location for our business? There's a really interesting question. Most of our business, most of the gross volume, over half of it is online. So in that sense, location means nothing for it. It doesn't matter. We use our Ome house for a shipping center. We could be anywhere. But the Asaksa shop has, in recent years, become an increasingly major part of our business. It's not half yet, but uh, probably maybe this year it might be half of our, our revenue. And for that to happen, we need to be in a location that's accessible by tourists. Not just accessible, but desirable, a place where they want to go. There would be some people who would come and see us no matter where we were in Tokyo. We could be on some back street that you take, you know, two hours to get to. And some people would still come there. But by and large, most people that visit us come here because they want to see us, and we're right at a place where they were going to go anyway. Namely, Asakusa. We could do it half and half. We could be, for example, in Asakusa on a back street. And that would be a plus minus. We wouldn't get the casual walk-in traffic, people who didn't know about us. But we would still get the fans. They would happily go and see the temple and then look up their, look up our address on their, on their phone and walk around to the back street and see us. So that would be a, another option. But still, this district is, at some point in the not too distant future, this district is toast. What's the consensus on the climate change, you know? The scientists have to be conservative when they tell us their guesstimates that it'll be a 2050 before the Greenland ice cap melts and stuff like that. But we also see lots of stories, almost every day, saying that it's happening a lot faster than they thought it was happening. So I don't know. In my lifetime, will I be leaving this building because it's underwater? No idea. No idea. No idea. Someone says, so you want to be in the anime district. So that, that's increasing. Over in the Ikebukuro district, well away from the ocean side, there's a major pop culture a revival there. Ikebukuro has become the anime go-to place. So if we wanted to put our money just on those chips with our Ukiwa heroes, we could go over there. But Ukiwa heroes now, although they did help us a lot 10 years ago, Ukiwa heroes are not the main thrust of our business. That's not all we do. It's part of what we do, but it's not all of what we do at all. So I, I wouldn't want to uh, put our whole business based on that. There's been so many visitors here the last weekend. It's really, really great. Saturday was chaos. Chaos. It was fun, fun, fun chaos. We had a flood of visitors, so much of a flood that there was no semblance of Dave getting any work done. I didn't even bother sitting behind the desk here. I was just out on the floor. People would come in, we'll chat, another more people. And we were mostly talking about that video that I made last year. That because there were so many visitors, it wasn't getting any work done. <laughs> that, became, that became the topic of conversation with most visitors. So... So if I sat behind the desk, the people would come in. They wouldn't bother me because they've seen the video. But so in order to make things happen, I, you know, I got away from the desk and chatted with people. And it's a change. You're talking with one person and then someone who's over there who's browsing. He hears the conversation. He turns around and says, me too. You know, I've seen the videos as well. So it really, really, really was a ton of fun Saturday. Sunday was a bit quieter, but Saturday was a ton of fun. I was, at the end of the day, I was so exhausted. We had a light dinner. Sadako was here on Saturday, so we went for a light dinner afterwards. We must have closed the shop at 6, whatever. 
went for a light dinner nearby, then she went home. So around seven or something, I come back here. And I just sat there at my desk. I got a list of things I was supposed to do, you know, but I just sat there, oh, on my desk, read a newspaper. I went to bed about nine and slept straight through. Woke up in the same position. I went to bed at six. So 10, nine, nine to six, like nine hours dead to the world. It's exhausting, actually. I don't know if it, maybe it's my age or, or whatever. It's more exhausting than like running a marathon or something, you know. Full day of a really fairly intense conversation, turning from one person to the next and trying to keep track of what they're saying and trying to trying to be a, you know trying to keep up your end of these conversations and stuff. And it's it's really hard work. It's a ton of fun, but it's exhausting. I don't need no marathons. I shouldn't even bother going to the pool. Just visits. This is one hard little piece of wood, actually, and uh, I was really still trying to figure out why did I ignore it years ago? Why did I paste something on the back of this piece of wood and then not use it and flip over to the other side? And I don't know, but one possible idea is that I, I looked at one corner of it and nibbled at it and found that it was too hard. And it is, it's one chunky little block here. It turns out that's what we want on this one because we don't want the uh, that heavy pigment to grind away the blocks. So maybe this is the face I should have used back at the beginning. Question about the printing workstations. Why are the printing tables angled downward? I can't see it here. When we're printing, the printing tables are angled away from us. And it's an easy thing to reply to. The point being that when we're rubbing with our printing tool, if we were rubbing on a flat table like this, we would have an angle on our wrist. Or if we were standing up and printing on a table, like this, we would have a severe angle in our wrist, and you can't do that all day long. You'll kill yourself. You'll kill yourself. So the printing tables are angled downwards. I can only mock it up here. They're angled downwards so that your wrist stays straight. You grip your printing tool, you're rubbing on the wood block, and your wrist is absolutely ruler straight. No carpal tunnel, no, you know, whatever it is. Your power comes from your back, leaning over towards it, but the wrist stays straight. The glassing, somebody made, was it was Sonic when she was watching these streams. And she says, it's a thing, you know, I'm carving, pick up my glasses, put them on, take my glasses, put them off, pick up my glasses, put them on. I can't help it, you know. I need the glasses to be able to read this chat, and I don't need them to be able to look through the scope. So I can't, uh, it's off and on, off and on, off and on. And I guess I, I shouldn't spend too much time on these streams looking at the, the text. I sit there, oh, reading this, you know. I've got to look at it to get some of the questions. You know.
don't know if there was a question on oh, the paper is out today there's one printer today we're still in a pretty slow season we've got people off you know Aimi Chan our, our young Aimi Ohashi she comes from Hokkaido and uh, she's gone back up to Hokkaido for a couple of weeks she didn't go at the New Year's season I guess her her husband his job um, forced him to uh, know, to work through the New Year but now that the New Year's season is behind them, they've gone up to Hokkaido to visit her family for a couple of weeks. So all of her paper is in the freezer. She's printing the chrysanthemums print, the postcard version. That paper's in the freezer for a couple of weeks. And uh, Ishikawa-san, she went to India. And uh, she's just back. She brought us back some, some little presents. And she came over the other day and made chai tea for everybody. I guess based on a new recipe she learned in uh, Mumbai. So she went over to India for the for the New Year holidays. Must be nice, they working for us as a printer. We can afford to take global holidays like this all the time. <laughs> I don't know how long they were there for. A week, ten days, I don't know. She brought back tea and didn't just bring back tea and drop it on the desk. She brought back tea and went upstairs, got the kettle out and cups, and she made tea for us all. This this nice new chai tea recipe or something she had learned and the ingredients she'd got. So So if, if our employees can afford to take vacations like that, does that mean we're getting paid too much, our prices are too high? I don't know. Is there enough light? I'm not sure. It might be still a bit dark. Am I the most experienced carver at Moko Hong Kong? Yes, of course. I mean, I've been at this 40 plus years. There's, who is there now? There's Dave here with 40 years experience. The other end of the scale, Taran San has four or five years of experience. Only the last year of it, so professionally. Chon San has been doing this for about 10 years. 
Kawasaki san, she's been doing it now in her second career, about 10 years. She did it for five or six years younger in life. I'm far and away the most experienced in terms of length of time doing it and in terms of doing a whole bunch of different kinds of work all over the place. But I'm certainly not the most experienced carver in town. The, some of the older guys at Adachi or uh, Asuka Sensei, Asuka san, you know, my, my friend who we meet, Taran san's teacher. He's been doing it as long as I have, but working as a professional carver during that time. So I'm certainly one of the top most experienced people in the country, the most experienced here at Moka Hong Kong. We don't talk about who's the best. It doesn't really mean anything before. What did they do before microscopes? When your eyes got old, I wouldn't be able to do this. If we didn't have these tools, I would be retired. I cannot see the blocks well enough to carve. I would be wiping the floor or, or you know, making YouTube videos or whatever. I would not be carving. Any reports from the daughter's printing event? Yes, there is. She did the first event, the print party thing, back in early January, and there is not going to be a February event. It turns out that's not on the cards. There was a bunch of things in the mix. My time available over there, the time for the people at the preschool, uh, the money issues. There's three or four things were all involved, and it is decided that I will not be taking tools over into Canada. I will just be simply... Uh, having a family visit. So there won't be an event in February, I'm sorry. Dave is just going to chill out with his family. Do I have a TV block? Yes, it's under the... You know, I'll be using it next week. We have a TV crew coming next week to see us. So I will be using it next week. I'm going to dig it out now. It's right at the back of the cupboard there. You've seen it before. Taransan was here last week. We had a carver's meeting, so a bunch of the carvers were over here. We were chatting about this and that. And Taransan stayed for a while after the meeting. And we were in my room upstairs, and I forget, the conversation came up to uh, Ito-san or something. I can't remember why. And I, I opened the closet there, and I dragged out. I have Ito-san's TV block still here. So he and I were looking at that. And uh, it's a mixed thing to look at that, because it's from very, very, very late in his life. And he wasn't really doing very well. He was 80-something. He was, you know, not all that healthy. So looking at that block, we have to look at it with mixed, uh, you know, have to be careful when we look at it as to how much of it is absolutely perfectly authentic of the best that could be. And it's a TV block, so it's, it's not done in a normal order. Bits of it are carved off that would not normally be carved. But it is really, really interesting to look at. And there it is, his last carving strokes are there on the, on the block. I'll be featuring that in part three, you know, Remembering a Carver, part three, the epilogue. I have to get that done sometime in the next few months. And that TV block will, of course, be part of it. It's a funny block. It's crispy, crispy. Not easy to carve at all. Well, the UK, honestly, the TV, no, the TV program is not about us. I, I've got to clarify a little bit more. There will be a TV crew coming here. They're going to interview me a little bit. They're going to get a little tiny scrap of a carving scene here. 
They're going to go upstairs, show the printer's room, a couple of printers printing. But what they're mostly here for is they're going to show the shop. And the program is not about me. The program is about Miyako Dori, the new publisher who is publishing Shinohanga prints, the ones carving with the laser. You know, the prints by Kashiwagi-san. Uh, you've seen them, Ginza in the rain, and the one with the carp, the carp picture that's designed by our friends in France, Atelier Cento. The program is about that company. And as part of the program, they want to show where that company's prints are sold. So the woman, she was here last week, we talked about this. The woman was here last week to see our shop and see where these prints are done and to be able to talk to some of the uh, overseas visitors. And what she hopes to do is catch an overseas visitor here looking at one of Miyakodori's prints and saying, yeah, this is so cool. But that's why she's here. That's why they will be here next week. I'm not sure what day it will be. And the Miyakodori prints are all carved with lasers. That's what kashiwagi sans career is. He's a laser engineer of some kind. They're printed in the normal way with uh, woodblock uh, watercolor printing techniques, but the carving is all done with a laser. Very difficult wood here at the edge. Both grain both ways is, is no good. It wants to chip both ways. So difficult here. Questions, questions, questions. Karen's talking about the laser carving and the you know, wood. They're actually doing extremely, extremely fine. He's done some experiments with ukiyo-e type prints with super delicate hair, and they've done it. They have carved these with laser, and he's got the laser. It's, it, there's lasers and lasers. I know. Maybe after the program is done, we'll have some video clips we can show you. The typical wood carving with laser is the wood is there, the laser burns in, and it leaves all straight edges and burned edges and all that kind of stuff. This is not what they are doing. They have lasers with different power levels. They can dial it up and dial it down. And his laser is not simply an XY axis burning down he has got full flow of motion. The laser can turn, do angled cuts, pull up, do angled cuts, pull up, switch over and cut down. This laser is almost doing what we are doing, taking a knife and taking off this bit of wood, that bit of wood. 
It's completely different to the normal bzzz. So what you know about lasers and wood carving may not apply to what's going on here. We'll learn more about it in this upcoming program. But the lines on the prints that we have from him in this shop are there at the level that we can carve with our knives. So I don't know anything about what frequency it's burning at or what specific, uh, is it a carbon dioxide laser, whatever. I know nothing about the technology behind it. All I know is I've seen blocks and prints that Kashiwagi san has brought to me. He brought prints first and said, what do you think about this? And I'm like, yeah, who carved that? And he said, my laser. And I said, well, actually, I don't think so because this is, you know, blah, blah. And he smiles and he brings out the block. <laughs> so, so I've been through this process of uh, denial and then seeing how it actually works. And he's got two, he's got five prints in his catalog so far. We have three of them. The two really popular ones, Ginza in the Rain and the, the one, what's it called? The one with the carp. I can't remember the title of it. They're out of stock. He can't find a printer to print them. It's printers. He's asked me, print them. We can't. We're busy printing our own stuff. Desperate for printers. Those prints would be out of stock instantly if we had them today. So I'm sorry not to have more, more knowledge about the laser. Maybe you can. Maybe he's got information online. I don't know. I really haven't looked it up. I'm not all that invested in that and interested in it. But it is happening. It is happening. So before you, you, uh, before you write it off, uh, keep your open mind there because this guy is doing it in a different way to the way other people have been cutting patterns on wood with lasers. And the TV program, it's going to be Japanese domestic TV. I doubt very much. They may have an internet channel where it might be available. I don't know. Whether that will be region controlled, IP address controlled, I don't know. I will let you know as I learn more. Ernie's got a question. If they get robots to print their laser-carved blocks, are they still Mokohanga? 
I guess so. Mokuhanga means wood print. Doesn't say who did it. I don't know. <laughs> Remember, you got the Miyakudori thing at the moment. Lasers have carved these things. Uh, carvers have printed away scoop. What they do is they, do, they use laser to carve the line area. They're not using lasers to carve out this part. So this part is being scooped out manually, but the lasers have done all the edge work and all the line work. Then the blocks go to a printer who prints it in the normal way. That's not so different from what Yoshida has been doing for over a hundred freaking years. You go back to when did the first ones come up? 1930s. Yoshida started using metal key blocks. Yoshida would draw the block, draw, draw the design, send it to a company, back comes a, a zinc block, a zinc plate for the key block. They then transferred it to color blocks, carved the color blocks by hand and printed it. So some of the Yoshida prints that are in my catalog right now and the Yoshida prints that have been all over the world, the East Africa famous animals, those are zinc blocks. The blocks weren't carved by hand. They were done photographically. Everybody accepts them as wood block prints. So there's not actually not so much difference between that and what kashibagi san is doing right now at all. Again, this is not my business. I'm not doing lasers here at Mokohanka, and we are still doing it this way. Takamizawa. <coughs> they use metal blocks way, way back for the key blocks of many of their ukiyo reproductions. Somebody calls them wood block prints. So at least this time around, Kashibagi-san, he is open and up front. That's a point of pride with him. He's not using lasers and hiding it, like the Yoshidas never talked about their metal plates at all. You'd never hear them talking about it. But kashibagi is not hiding it. It's a pride. Look at this. We've made this cool system to get lasers to do this. And from his point of view, the key point is not that it was carved you know, by a handmade carver, but his point is the artist's lines are thus reproduced perfectly. His main designer, you know, uh, Tsuchimocha, draws the stuff and the lasers cut it exactly the same as the guy designed it. In the old days, the, you saw what's happening with my other series. Hokusai brushed it and the carvers then went to town and changed everything. So from these guys who are using these metal blocks and or the laser things, remember from their point of view, this is way, way more accurate and more realistic and truer to the artist's intention. It's not just a question of saving money and getting rid of a carver. You may be as cynical as you want, you know, the Yoshidas, that was a factor for the Yoshidas, of course, it was way, way cheaper to do it that way. How cynical are you? I don't know. chisel fighting the bad grain of this wood you know why am I doing this when it could be done by a machine there really is no deeper more more richer answer than the one I can always give just simply I like doing this the result is pleasant enough that it makes a product that many people want to share and use in their own life and that's good enough Nobody's claiming here this is the most efficient, fastest way to do things. We're talking to a guy who likes doing this, and people like using the products that we make. So that's enough for me. I mean, the robots came for this job, you know, a couple of hundred years ago. Printing press, whatever. You know. We met our technological Rubicon. 
many, many, many years ago. Not Rubicon, what's a better analogy? We met our technological uh, moment of crisis, moment of truth. I don't know what's the best analogy to use. <sighs> Not Rubicon, nothing to do with Rubicon. I don't know which one I pulled that out. I think we are done. We have a color pop. Bingo. <laughs> to quick recap for those who didn't see the beginning of this story a couple of days ago, this is a replacement block. It's not a new print we're making. This is a replacement color block for this one. The color block we've been using for the background for this print. I don't know if I have it. No, I erased it the other day. I don't have it. I'm sorry. It's a replacement for this block, which has worn out due to abrasion through rough pigments. The face of the character, the back of the head, you can see it there. The brush has been wiping, 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 wiping for a decade now, and the pigments are extremely abrasive. So they've worn out here but not on these edges because the brush rubs this way. This is a gradation. If this had been a block with no gradation, the brush would have been going, it would have been going around and around and around and the abrasion would have been all over the place and maybe not so strong. But because this was a gradation and the brush was coming in one direction only like this, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, always nothing but back and forth, that edge and this edge, Got all the, got all the uh, pressure, got all the wear and tear, and this line wore out beyond the point where we could use it. And I'm not going to change the arrow. No. The string doesn't need to be carved out. The string is in black. 
and it's opaque pigment, it will be printed. So it will cover up the orange. The orange will be on the paper, the black line will be visible. Even though the black line goes first, and we put the colors on top later, the coloring we're using is basically transparent pigments. So the black outline will always stay and show, even though the colors come on top of it. With all of our prints, well, 99.99% .99 of our prints, that's how it works. Okay, now, what have we got for the rest of this stream? For the next few minutes, taking us up to the hour, I've got something a little bit different for you. I'm going to ask your, uh, ask your forbearance here. I've got a five-minute video clip. I've been reading the chat where possible at lunchtime, where I discover all the questions that I should have answered, or somebody answers a question that I asked, but I didn't catch it because I was, you know, like trying to do a bit of work. In one of the streams, was it Thursday or last Monday, a week ago, somebody said, does Dave ever wear kimono? And I think somebody else, I don't remember the exact conversation, but somebody else says, no, 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 Dave has no Japanese clothes at all. He always wears just shabby Western clothes. And I do. I wear basically nothing but jeans and a dirty shirt and a sweatshirt or whatever. But have I worn kimono? Yes. And I have video proof of it. Can you stand watching a five-minute video clip from Kinosaki Onsen? I have no actual rights to, 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 uh, to broadcast this because I don't own the program. But five minutes, let's do this. This is NHK broadcast in 20, ah, I don't know, pre-pandemic, two, three years, 2018, 2017, somewhere on there. I think it comes with sound, but I don't know. When I start playing this, let me know if you can hear the audio. If you can't hear the audio, I'll give you a voiceover. If you can hear the audio, I'll just let it run. Let me know if you can hear things. Mm. We are in Kinosaki Onsen. Oh, made it. <laughs> so this is the same rule? Yes. Okay, so left. No, right first. Right first, and the left side top. Okay, so we have a bit of a problem here. <laughs> and it's February. Oh, this is heavy. <laughs> oh, really? It's warm. Every I'm ball. getting warm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Nishimuraya is the name the most expensive ryokan in Kinosaki. This special outdoor bath can be rented by the hour. This is a low timber, a Japanese outside bath. It's a little chilly out here. Oh, wonderful. Look at this. You couldn't ask for a better recipe. Snow, winter, an ambience like this. It's a fantastic place, my God. It's hot, but it's not going to be too hot. Let's get inside. It's Kinosaki Onsen, the town, and this place is called Nishimura-ya. Oh, English menu, wonderful, wonderful. I mean, I know what many of these things are, but I'm sure some of them I don't understand. That's <laughs> okay. This is aperitif. Oh, thank you. It's not easy to get to this place. You're Yumiko Sanska. Ah, yeah, I'm Yumiko, your room attendant. Good, thanks very much. It's pleasure to serve you. Thank you. David's dinner is a feast of crab, delivered directly from the fish market at the port. Okay. And if you have to ask how much it costs, the rich, creamy hairs of the crab shell are considered a prime delicacy. <laughs> Mm. 
やっぱりソーティーシーフードですねそうソーティー味が出てますね、はい、Very easy OK And of course the crab legs are delectable There's a simple dip made with vinegar mixed with soy sauce and savory dashi broth. It was fantastic, of course. Just listen to me. I'll tell you about it in a minute after this clip. Very nice. Yeah. The next morsel is sashimi. The crab legs served raw with all their freshness intact. Okay, let's give this a try. I'm gonna make a mess here. Huh? Mm. Mm. Okay, I get to the I see. She's prepared a, a cup for me for the legs. Hey. Okay, thank you. That's another different one. More. I saw on the menu this crab, 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 and I'm thinking this might be not so interesting, but actually it's a different food every time she brings it out to the table. Okay. The next dish is grilled over charcoal. I'll ask you questions in It has a special dip, the rich, salty innards of the shell. Mm. Again, another different combination there. <laughs> When we sat down here two hours ago, I was expecting to get a beautiful meal. And of course, they've given me a beautiful meal. But it's been a lesson in how to take one simple ingredient, we've had just crab, and treat it with different materials, and different cooking styles, and end up with a complete symphony of different tastes. That sounds like a cliche, but it's absolutely true. We've had a wonderful performance here this evening. Well, thank you very much for helping me with this. It's been fantastic. You're welcome. Good, thank you. <laughs> Influencer Dave. <laughs> okay, there we have it. The thing about this, though, you saw the spread. That's not what normally happens. This is your meal, and that's what normally they serve, but they don't serve it all at once normally. You and your partner, whoever is in the room with you, they usually couples go, they, they will bring the appetizer, and then they will bring the next course, and the door is opening and closing all over the next couple of hours as they bring the dishes one by one by one normally. If for the purpose of making the program here, they brought them all at once and put them all out on the table. Then what they did was they took them off the table and she served them to me one by one. I took one bite and then they took it away. And there's the producer, the cameraman, the sound man, the, the owner of the inn is there watching to make sure everything happens. So remember, there's, there's six or seven people behind the camera there. And she's got all the food on now on the floor behind her and she gives them to me one by one to, to, to show how the thing would work. And all I get is just one little tiny clip of each one, then she takes it away and we do the next one. So that we don't want to film this thing for two hours while Dave sits there and stuffs himself. So the point being, I got one little nibble of every one and she took it away. And then at the end of it, at the end there, you know, I'm sitting there with the pot and yeah, we, blah, 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 talk, 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 away we go. The guy says, cut, that's it. And there we are and there's me The girl is gone, the master is gone, there's me, the producer, the cameraman, the light man, and the sound man, the five of us. That's our food. All the food comes back on the table and five people, it's all gone in a minute. Then what happens next is the producer says, okay guys, we'll head back to our yoka because the team is not staying at this expensive place. The team is staying at some super cheap place, back they go. I'm left in the room by myself Dinner is over, and I've had one fifth of the, <laughs> of the dinner, and that's it. The door's closed, the kitchen's closed, we're isolated place, and for the next 10 hours I sleep there, and I'm starving, <laughs> starving to death. <laughs> it was so cool. Ah. Well, it was a cool experience, but, you know, if I had known in advance how it was going to play out, I could have gone to the convenience store before, put something in my bag, so I would have had something to eat later. So, 
uh, no, they didn't think about that. I didn't think about this. Nobody planned this. And there I am. And the girl says, okay, good night. See you in the morning. She was there in the morning, like 6.30 in the morning. The door opens and the same girl is there. Here's your breakfast. You know, I'm like, don't you ever sleep? And she says, well, I was on the late shift yesterday and I'm on an early shift today. So it was cool. It's a very, very, very expensive place. And literally, if you have to ask, there's no way. We could look it up. The place is called Nishimuraya. I'll, I'll put it in English here. Nishimuraya in Kinosaki Onsen. That's the place name. I have no idea how much it costs. Of course, I didn't pay for it. But 85k yen per night, but you probably have to book minimum two people, I think. I don't think you're allowed to book there by yourself. That's what I heard, I think, when I was up there doing that program. And there's a few things to mention about those programs. I, know I, I, I don't do them anymore. I'm retired, not voluntarily, but I'm retired, fired, laid off, whatever you want to say, from NHK. I used to do the Journeys in Japan system. I was one of the rotating hosts for that program. And then, actually, that was the last one I did. We've talked about this before. I know they, they said there won't be any more. They were changing the mood of the channel. They wanted younger female presenters instead of older white guy presenters, which I understand. They wanted to change the, uh, the mood of their channel. So I think that was the last one I did. The newest ones have older dudes, hosts, too. Well, whatever, whatever, whatever. I did a bunch of them. Can't complain. If they don't want me to do any more, that's fine. That's their choice. I've got my own YouTube channel now. So, But the thing about staying in those places is I was a beneficiary there of a new rule. When I started doing the Journeys in Japan program, we would do things like we would get to the place, the camera rolls, Dave goes into the room, he opens the window, my God, I'll be so happy to be staying in this glorious place tonight. We look at that tatami, we see the bath and stuff like that. Then it's cut, finish filming, and we go about and stay in cheap digs. We would stay in a cheap ryokan. But the people who saw the program assumed that David was staying in this wonderful, glorious place. But it wasn't true. Then at some point, it would be about 2010 or somewhere around there, there was a scandal with NHK with some program they made about crime and gangsters and stuff. And they had faked some of the things in the program. Nothing, nothing, nothing to do with me. And a new rule came down with all NHK documentary and travel programs, no fakery. If you show that room and the presenter, ah, this is such a cool place to sleep tonight, then he had to sleep there. And I was a beneficiary of this at that place, Nishimuriya, very expensive. I did stay there, sleep there. I got the food, got the bath, got the other benefits. And so their policy of no fakery of any kind on the programs really came back to benefit me. So The other thing is the pants. We've talked about the pants, Dishel, the NHK pants. You saw me there in an onsen. That rule changed too. When I started doing these programs, every travel program always has a bath scene because onsen is a big deal in Japan. And they, we, you would strip off, take your little towel, go into the bath, stand there, and they get the camera ready. Okay, sit here, please. Walk here, please. Do this, please. And you're naked, but it doesn't matter. It's a Japanese bath. This is the way it is. And it's even fun when sometimes the camera crew, the cameraman is a guy, the sound one is a girl, whatever. You're all in this thing together. This couple with the producer was a lady, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm stripped off when you're in there. And you didn't ever see somebody's naked body walking naked in the thing. You're just in the water properly. And it turned out, unknown to me and nothing to do with me again, that there was another scandal where at some point along the line here, it was a female presenter, and maybe it was a female camera crew, I don't know, whatever. But as part of it, back in the cutting room when they were making the program, ready to show her, you know, in the water, but they didn't show the naked presenter walking around, somebody stole some of the footage, it went on the internet, and it was a big, huge scandal. So after that, NHK changed the rules. No naked presenters at all in front of the camera, even in the parts where you're preparing the thing. So when we went to this one in Kinosaki, I'm just, I mean, outside, get my clothes off, walking. The guy says, no, 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 no. Put your pants on, put your pants on. Don't you have your pants? I mean, what are you talking about? Don't I have my pants? Now, it's an onsen. He said, no, the new rule, you're supposed to wear. And he had brought with him a little pair of, of flesh-colored briefs. He says, put them on. And I'm like, I'm a big boy, I don't care. He says, put them on. It's a company rule. No naked presenters in front of the camera. So the one you saw me there, I was actually wearing tinted, flesh-tinted briefs in the water so that it doesn't show you know, at any time.
Makes sense, I guess. Some people had misbehaved, so it was necessary to change the rules. Can you see the full program there? I don't know. NHK puts them in rotation. You can see them on their YouTube channel. Sometimes they put them on and take them off. They rotate them all the time. I have no control over this, this stuff. I don't own the program at all. How did I get the chance to be on the program? I don't know. 20, 25 years ago, I was kind of well known in Japan when I was doing my poet series. I wasn't famous, but I was whatever, whatever. I was on NHK all the time. Now, the rest of the stream. It's 9.06. Also, to what's going to be happening now with these streams for the next few weeks. I will be carving the next Hokusai print, but my uh, Taran-san and Chon-san and Asuka-sensei are involved in that project as well. My next Hokusai print is going to be the November print. So I don't need to start tracing and carving that here in January. Hopefully I won't start on October the 31st, but whatever. I don't need to get started now. So it's time for me now to catch up with some of the projects that I should have finished last year or two years ago. Three guesses on what I should be doing for carving in the next couple of weeks. Someone's put eight views of cats. I'm not the carver on the next one of those. That's going to be Chonsan. And the rest of you have got it. Chocolate eggs to everybody who has mentioned Surfer Girl. The blocks have been sitting here, waiting. We've done test printing on them. Here's where we're at as a recap. A recap, a recap. This is the design. This first sheet is a color copy of the print that was published in 1974. It was made for Okada-san by the Watanabe Company. And I guess they actually published it. Seems they made about 100 copies. I'm not 100% sure on the provenance of this. Numbered copies are out there. They seem to be numbered slash over 100. There are also a lot of unnumbered copies out there. And there are also some copies that come up in the market now and then printed on fresh, clean paper. So it seems like somebody has the block set. And rather than print a lot and put them out, they're printing one or two copies every now and then, dribbling them into the market, and they sell for quite high prices. I don't know what's going on. It could be that those are copies left over from the 1970s. So somebody just mentioned this, about eight grand or something, somebody bought from it. I don't know if that's an old print left from the 74 edition, or if somebody is playing with the blocks very, very cagely. I don't know. I have no knowledge about this. The copies that come onto the market all are coming through the same dealer in the US, so he may know a lot more about this than I do. In any case, that's nothing to do with me. Dave here has talked to Okada-san's family, and we have the rights to reproduce a great number of Okada-san's publications. Not all of them, because the family doesn't own all the rights. But we have the rights to make woodblock print reproductions of any of Okada-san's designs to which the family has the rights. And you're going to hear a lot more about this in 2026. But for now, we've taken on one project. We're going to make a reproduction of the Surfer Girl. We have, we own the rights to do this from the family. Now this is not new news. This is, this goes back two years. I'm telling you the story. For those of you who don't know what's going on. So I prepared a tracing, started carving, and this would be over the past couple of years. I have, don't have the whole block set on my desk here. We carved a set of I, we I carved a set of blocks for this, and we got some test printing from this last summer. And we have a problem. This is the color copy of the original. These are the first two proofs. These were not intended to be prints for sale. They are the first two proofs from the block. 
they're actually not finished. If you notice the original, you'll see there's an interesting texture on the surfboard. We're not still not quite sure how we'll be reproducing that. And these first two proofs didn't attempt to reproduce that texture. They were simply block check. And I discovered that I have a problem. When I had carved my version, <coughs> excuse me, the way the C works is this. The C is all the same sort of teal color. It starts with a light greeny teal. A bit more bluey teal comes on top of it. Layer two, farther on here. Layer three comes on top. Farther on, layer four comes on top. There are four layers of the blue-green on this print. So there have to be at least four blocks here to take care of this. And what I did was I first carved the base blue, then I carved another block and another block and another block. I did so on this stream, and I did so too flippantly and too carelessly. I don't remember what I was doing or thinking about. I was chatting with you guys while carving, and I can do this. It's an easy print and whatever. And what I did wrong was I wasn't careful enough about the width of the open spaces. If we look at things like this, do you see the open space in front of her face here, the white line here? Now, on a single block, that's easy enough. But when you're layering block number two, block number three, block number four, it's really critical that those blocks line up. If you've got a white gap and the two blocks are a little bit off each other, you're not going to get your full white gap anymore. That gap is going to be a little bit lighter than it should be. And what do you know, Dave ended up... Where are we here? Get on the camera. Look at this. There's my white line and there's the line on the original. And they're all clean and beautifully sharp. Watanabe's carvers did a fabulous, fabulous job. Dave did a careless, flippant job. And that's a bad one right there. The next one beside it is sort of okay. Some of them look all right. Some of them don't look okay. The farther we get into the territory where there's more and more blocks on top of each other, the worse mine get. And by the time we get to her back side here, where there's four blocks on top of each other, look at the difference. Beautiful, clear, open white lines in the real print. And look at this. Nowhere near good enough. And this 100%, this one's 100% on me. I'm so good at this. I know what I'm doing. Just go, 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 go. I can chat with people. I can throw this around. Come back to it next week. Do something else. Talk to some people. Do some programming. Come back to it. I can handle this. Someone says, big of you to own up to that. It's kind of, it's kind of nothing I can hide here. Um, yeah, it's okay. Let's print this and run with it. Sorry, I mean nothing. It's not big of me to own up to it. It's whatever. And anyway, I'm blaming you guys anyway, right? So, so, so here's what we are going to do. There's four blocks here for the blue. There's four blocks. There's the base blue, which has actually all of these lines. Let me zoom out a bit. There's the base blue. Here's, here's the, uh, the color copy again. The base blue has all of these white lines at that width. What happens then is, after you've done that and got it all set up, you then cut block number two for this part, block number three for that part, block number four for that part, and you make those blocks match that first block perfectly. But you've got to start with a good, clean bunch of white lines on the first block. So here's what's going to happen over these streams on the next little while. I'm going to go back to the first blue block. I'm going to pull a proof from it, and I'm going to compare with the original line. And I'm lucky in that most of my lines here are too narrow. So I'm going to be able to open them up to the proper width. I'm going to do this carefully. Cut a few, proof it, cut some more, proof it, cut some more, proof it. And I will end up with the first blue block based on my first one. I won't have to redo it. 
based on my first one, I will have a clean place to start. Then, the second, third, and fourth, I am going to throw away the careless ones that I made, because I can't tell if they're left or right or wrong. I'm going to throw those away, get some new pieces of wood, and do a very, very careful transfer. I probably won't do that on stream because, you know, it's got to be carefully done. And we'll see how she goes. So sorry about this. It's going to take a while, but it doesn't matter. It's going to be more things for you guys to watch. It'll be more interesting work as time goes by. The part that I have to say sorry about is, is that I'm going to be more careful. Obviously, I'm going to be more careful this time, but being more careful means I'm going to have to do some of those jobs late at night, peaceful, when the shop's closed and I'm not riding herd on a chat where I can focus on what's going on and do my job properly. I'm not blaming you guys for this. It's all on me, but there's stuff you can do. The block we did this morning, I can do that while we're chatting with my eyes closed, but some stuff you can't. So we'll see how it goes. Anyway, and at the end of it, we will have, I think, this, this job is not beyond me. We will have, at the end of it, a nice, nice print. So my apologies. Is this the part in the Japanese company where the, where the, the boss, the shacho, the cameras are all rolling and the news conference is on and the boss and his chief financial officer stand behind the table and they bow and apologize to all the shareholders? Is this that scene? <laughs> I guess this is that scene. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not blaming you guys for that, but... <laughs> okay, I know... Uh, do the rights to the tale of Genji, yes, we have the rights to all of those, but no, I am not going to be reprinting those tale of Genji prints. We're not. That's behind. Somebody else did that. Yu Yudo did that years ago. They exist. They're out there. We're going to move forward through Okada-san's work. I mean, he's got thousands and thousands and thousands of illustrations. He was a very busy illustrator all through the 70s, 80s, 90s, before he a little bit fell out of fashion. I teased about 2026, and I can openly talk about this. The idea is that we will make occasional prints of Okada-san stuff, like the Surfer Girl now, then we'll maybe do a Kabuki one, maybe then we'll do a Hey and Era Lady. But one idea, not confirmed, but one idea, is to go through his over and take some beauties, some uh, older prints, some Kabuki, some this and that, some different genres, and make a subscription series out of it. Whether I can pull that off or not, I don't know, but I can publicly mention this. One of the ideas in the mix for the 2026 subscription series is a set of Okada Yoshio designs. Whether we can make it happen, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. Okay, it's show and tell time. I don't have a brand new show and tell. We're gonna pick up that treasure chest box again. If I can do it without dropping it. Someone says, is there a link to this designer's catalog of prints? He doesn't have a catalog of prints. <clears throat> the only prints made from his work were the four prints from the Genji series, the Genji Emaki. Uh, Watanabe did three prints of his back in the 1970s. And that's it. That's it. There is no catalog of prints. Our desk does indeed have a hole in it. My desk has two holes in it. Any guesses as to why there should be two holes in it? Where did we get to? I don't remember. 
we looked at one, two, three, we looked at four, we looked at five. I think that's as far as we got. Yeah. Let's just look at a couple more. Of course, one for left hand and one for right hand. The desk was originally owned by, I don't know, uh, Haradasa, who was a right-handed carver. Dave is left-handed. So I had to make a new hole. What's the light outside? What's the bright light? It's reflecting up. Oh, it's from the Richmond Hotel. And the sun is pretty much exactly behind the camera. And there will be windows on the Richmond Hotel which face this way. So the sun at the moment is on the Richmond Hotel shining back to us. And part of, like the Don Quixote building is curved. So the sun goes across it and keeps shining at us minute after minute after minute. It looks like an angelic truck. Again, it's the delivery of cold, hot towels. This was one of the prints like this were one of the main motivations for me to do something like this hunger treasure chest. When I started this project, I absolutely knew, and what I told the customers was, you're not going to see greatest hits. This is not going to be a collection of famous ukiyo-e designs. Dave is going to dig deep. Dave is going to thrash through unexplored byways. Dave is going to try and bring all kinds of stuff that simply show beauty of woodblock prints. It's sort of the same concept as I did with the Beauty of Woodblock Prints series many years later, the mystique of the Japanese print. I just wanted to make stuff that looked beautiful. And this print to me, this typifies that. What's it about? Nothing. What's the message here? Nothing. What's going on? Nothing. It's just simply patterns. It's from a person who did lots of work in making patterns for kimonos and things. Hakamada Sekka, I think is a family, and that was their business, doing general design work. So this thing is absolutely nothing. Dave just wanted to play with paper, with color, with gradation, and with a little bit of uh, tomfoolery, tricking your eyes. As to what's on top, what's going on, what is this, what are those white things stuck on top of the piece of paper. It doesn't make any sense, just simply, it's uh, delightful. And again, I could have used that same phrase, embrace the delight, for this series as well. If you think this is easy to make, you got another thing coming. Because without a key block, it's extremely difficult, extremely difficult to get this stuff all lined up. There's no key block. And if you don't get it right, if your yellow block and your red block don't match up right, you can look, sort of see it's a bit of a tiny bit of variation there, then those white, white shapes don't look correct. Remember, the white shapes don't exist. They're only created by leftover after the other ones are done. So if your yellow and your red don't line up exactly, then that white shape will look strange. This is one of the most difficult prints in that set. The registration is pinpoint critical because there's no black lines to hide any little bit of variation. You can see a bit of variation there, right? Look at this. Not quite right. The blue is a little bit off and the shape of the white pattern is not quite accurate. Good morning. Oh, it's Udagawa-san today coming in for work. Good morning, good morning. She was here yesterday, too. So the Japanese collectors got that one Monday morning. And then two weeks later, they would get the next one. And this, many of you have seen before, many of you have got this 
this is one of Mokohankan's top sellers. This is the first appearance of our carp. So I'm saying, were those rectangles cut out of, they were cut out of all the blocks. Because the rectangles are white, they had to be cut out of every one of those blocks in exactly the same place. And here we are. This is the first appearance of our famous floating carp design from Hokusai, stolen from a larger print of his. And it has a replica of a Sumi Nagashi pattern. You know, the deal where you, I think in the West they call it marbling. You've got water, you put little drops of oily pigment on top of the water, they float, you swirl them around into colors, you put your paper gently on top of the water, pick it up, and the paper picks up the marbled pattern. In Japan it's called sumi nagashi. This is not done that way. I took a sumi nagashi pattern, carved it on wood. And if we had some side light, you'd be able to see the paper here is very much a patterned and embossed with the pattern. These blocks now, I have to say, actually, the prints we are making from these blocks now, they're still okay, but they are showing some real, real wear and tear. And I, you saw me earlier in the stream today. You saw me recutting a block for the link print. It won't be long before we are recutting blocks for this one, because the color blocks for the fish are kind of worn out. Let's grab one more quickly and then shut it down. And then continuing with the theme of continuing to surprise the customers, the next one went wild with a totally different, something they'd never seen before. The designer here is completely unknown to anybody else, not a standard ukiyo-e designer, Hanabusa Icho, and this is a book page illustration. Do you know the story? Do you know the story? It's not about a white elephant. It's about a story. What's the moral of the story? It's the whatever, eight blind men or five blind men or whatever. Maybe it's an old Chinese tale, whatever. It's easy to relate. Eight blind men or a group of blind men are taken out into the world to, to see stuff and they're, they're taken to see an elephant. And one guy grabs the elephant's legs. He says, wow, this elephant, the thing we're calling an elephant, is round and cylindrical. Next guy gets the tail. No, 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 this thing we call an elephant is, you know, whatever. The point being, each of these guys sees a different part of this thing that has different shapes. They all come back and compare their notes of what an elephant is. And they're thinking, like, we didn't actually see the same thing. I don't get it. Why are our stories all so different? And you get the idea. The moral of the story is, be kind to other people and make sure uh, you're understanding that they may see things in a different way from you and let's all live together and be friendly and buddy buddy and happy happy <laughs> no matter what it is out there in the world different people see it in a different way and value it in a different way and whatever and for sure we're back in the same story with ukiyo-e artists depicting animals they couldn't do cats they couldn't do dogs and there's no bloody way they were going to be able to do an elephant <laughs> <laughs> Hot lips. Dig those eyelashes. <laughs> Whatever. It was a ton of fun to make and it's good fun to look at and it's Okay, there we have it. We'll leave it there tonight. We'll get back through the box later on. Okay, it's Monday morning. I'm off for three more days now, off full of other work. I'll be back here Thursday morning, and I guess, according to plan, I should be working on that blue color block for the surfer girl. It might be slow going. I might be doing a bit of trimming, looking at something, doing a bit of trimming. I don't really know how it's going to work on stream, but uh, that's the idea. Thanks very much. Let's pull up the outside to finish off here. The towel guy, he delivers to a bunch of different shops around here, not Mokohankan yet. Never thought you'd see a hot tub. That's right, we're getting ready. <laughs> 
that was just the first step. We're going to switch to OnlyFans and all of our chats are going to come from a hot tub from now on. <laughs> okay, see you on Thursday. Thanks very much, gang. Three, two, one. Let's get out of here. Thank you.